Good morning, everybody. How's it going? Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast, coming to you from the beautiful city of Seville. Not quite the beautiful morning that I hoped it would be in terms of the weather. It's cloudy, it's miserable, it's been raining throughout the night. Hoping it's going to clear up uh, a little bit later on today because I've got plenty I still want to see uh, before I leave the city um, tonight. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We are here to talk about Arsenal's victory over Sevilla last night. A big win for the Gunners um, in the context of that Champions League group. And if I'm not mistaken, it's Arsenal's first away win in the Champions League for a long, long time. I think you have to go back as far as December 2016, I want to say, to find the last one. So, yeah, it's been a long time coming. And on this episode of the pod, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the lineup. We're going to talk about how the game panned out. We're going to discuss uh, David Raya. We're going to talk Takahiro Tomiyasu. We're going to talk Declan Rice. Uh, and we're going to discuss, of course, Gabriel Jesus, who was in wonderful, wonderful form last night. So there's plenty to get into. This won't be going out live just because I can't trust the stability of any internet connection where I currently am. So I figured I'd record this and put it out for you guys on YouTube as a premiere uh, so you can watch it as if it's live. Um, The only problem is I won't be able to access your questions. Um, And if you're listening on audio, well, it works the same way for you. So you won't have a problem uh, either way. But um, I will be doing another podcast tomorrow uh, on Thursday where we will focus solely on your questions. So if you've got any, please do leave them in the comments section Uh, below for me if you're wondering what this uh, structure is in the background is the setas de sevilla um, mushrooms of seville it means or some people call it las setas um, which is the home of a market and all the rest of it and uh, it is located uh, in seville's old city which is where i'm staying my hotel is literally um, a stone's throw away from here so i've just been able to stroll over get my cappuccino i feel like james richardson back in the football italia on channel four days um just sort of sitting here uh, recording but really really looking forward to breaking down what was a very successful night for the arsenal and um and reading some of your comments as well uh in the comment section to get a flavor of how you guys uh, saw the game as well um i'll start off with a little bit about how my trip's been to seville um i arrived here on monday night Uh, took a little walk around the city had a look around scouted some places out the great thing about Seville is you can literally walk anywhere Um, we walked from our hotel to the Estadio uh, Ramon Sanchez Pizuan which was 30 minutes walk away according to Google Maps but you know those things always overestimate took us about 20-25 minutes uh, to walk there we're gonna go and visit the Villa Marin Stadium the home of Real Betis a little bit later today as well which is only about Um, a 40 minute walk according to Google Maps which means it's probably about 30-35 minutes so we're going to go and do a little bit of that this afternoon as well but um, yeah in terms of the trip it's been great it's a beautiful beautiful city Um, I would highly recommend it I don't think you need probably more than two or three days here in that I think everything that you'd want to see is is within close proximity enough that you can do a lot of it in the same day and so you don't need to be here for a long long period of time Um, But of all the cities I've been to, I think this is up there with the most beautiful. The weather was great yesterday as well, which made the day incredibly pleasant. I'm hoping it's going to perk up a little bit today as well. Um, City, beautiful. My hotel, not so great. Um, You probably don't care, but I need to get this off my chest. I booked an Airbnb. Um, Obviously, it's half term. Uh, When Arsenal got drawn uh, to face Sevilla this week, of course, the prices on everything went crazy. So I was looking for value. Uh, more than anything else I booked an Airbnb and um, it's kind of a funny story I walked in there um, you know put all my stuff down went into the bathroom and there was no toilet paper none at all literally zero so I've had to walk out the door in the middle of the night and roam around the streets looking for toilet paper and no supermarket was open within walking distance of where I was staying at least that's how it seemed because I tried going in every direction. Um, in the end, I found some. But I, I know that, that sounds a bit disgusting and a bit random. But I just thought it was funny. Like, you book somewhere to stay. Would you ever think about that? Would you ever think about taking toilet paper with you? Which is mental. But anyway, let's get into the football. Because you're probably thinking, what the hell is he on about? Um, so, yeah. Uh, it was a really, really big win for Arsenal. Much needed. 
there was a possibility going into the game that if we didn't win, if we lost, and if PSV had beaten Lons, Arsenal could have sat bottom of the group, which would have been a disaster at this stage. You know, halfway through the group stage, you want to know that you're in a good position. You want to know that you're in a position to qualify. And look, now we're top of the group on six points from three games played. And of course, we face uh, both Seville and Lons at Emirates Stadium before that trip away to PSV on the final group game. Now, I would like to think that we can be qualified by the time we play PSV Eindhoven. And perhaps we might go there needing something to win the group. Um, it, it is possible that we win the group before we even get to that stage and that would be great wouldn't it because it was a group that when we looked at it we thought we'll probably get through this with a bit to spare and you know hopefully there'll come an opportunity where we can rest one or two players because we're having to go strong in this competition because it isn't the Europa League you can't get away with making those uh, heavy rotations that we did in the Europa League and still get through to the knockout stages this is a completely different kettle of fish I know people labeled this as a bit of a Europa League group because of the sides that were in it but you know they're here on merit as are we and that's just how it works but anyway we got to the Ramon Sanchez P1 yesterday after a wonderful day in the city as I say the Arsenal fans were gathered in the Salvador Square um, lots of beers as you can imagine lots of songs but everybody was really well behaved I thought with the exception of a couple of drunk people dropping glass bottles on the floor and breaking them um, you know it, it, the behaviour of the Arsenal fans, I thought, was impeccable out here. Um, but what I will say as well is that I thought um, the city of Seville hosted us brilliantly. Um, the Spanish people hosted us brilliantly. I know that there's a bit of a sort of wariness. Um, is that even a word? You know, Arsenal fans and English football fans tend to be a little bit wary when they come to Spain because of sort of the history with, with some of the police who have tended to go in a little bit too heavy-handed in situations that probably didn't require it but there was none of that yesterday there wasn't even a proper divide between one side of the away section and the home fans and there was no trouble whatsoever which was great to see everybody was there to enjoy the game and before kickoff um, there was a wonderful wonderful moment and I have to say um, it got me a bit emotional I I'm even feeling it talking about it I was a little bit teary-eyed I have to say because as uh, we all know, um, you know, Jose Antonio Reyes, who sadly passed away um, at such a young age, is well loved by not just the Arsenal fans, not even just the Real Madrid fans, for whom he won a La Liga title, but especially by the Sevilla fans. Local guy, one of their own. Um, he was adored here, won Europa Leagues with the club, and... Um, you know, will go down in history as, as one of their greatest ever players. And obviously, it's incredibly sad that he lost his life the way he did at such a young age. And um, what last night showed me before kickoff is that even though in football there is tribalism and even though, you know, football fans can cross lines and, and be a little bit over the top and, you know, um, you know, just, just act inappropriately, particularly since the emergence of social media, Actually, when it's something as big as that and as poignant as that and as sad as that, we can all come together. The Arsenal fans were chanting uh, Jose Antonio inside the stadium and that was met by applause from the Seville supporters um, around the rest of the stadium. And there was this, just this moment where the Arsenal fans were singing it at the top of their voices and the Seville fans were just taken back by it and they just turned towards the Arsenal fans and they all put their hands in the air and just applauded in the air and it was as I, like, I feel emotional speaking about it because I adored Jose Antonio Reyes I, I loved him as a player I thought he was fantastic and I actually felt a little bit of sadness with the way it ended at Arsenal in that I don't think he got to show his maximum at Arsenal you know the first season he arrived he looked great and he had some wonderful moments I'll always remember that goal against Chelsea for example at Highbury but you know just what a player what a career he had and it's so so sad um, that he's no longer with us but to see the two sets of supporters come together like that I think just just shows how wonderful football can be um, as you know as well as all the bad stuff that people talk about there is a an emotional side to the game and um, you really really felt it uh, here and, and Jose Antonio Reyes as dad had been speaking in the build up to this game saying that you know he loved his time at Arsenal 
and that you know he always said that that was his favourite place outside of Seville and uh, you know he said himself that he was hoping that um, there would be a draw last night so that both sides uh, would go away uh, relatively happy or relatively satisfied but anyway let's get into the game let's start off uh, with Mikel Arteta's starting 11 so it was David Ryer in goal um, back four of Ben White William Saliba Gabriel and Takahiro Tomiyasu the midfield was made up of Rice Jorginho and Odegaard with Saka Martinelli and Jesus in attack so the talking points with regards to the lineup would be first David Raya um, we talked about the fact that you know he hasn't really performed to a level that has persuaded Arsenal fans that Aaron Ramsdale no longer belongs in the first team um, you know there have been mistakes the distribution hasn't been very good which is the big point that he was sold to us on um, and you know in, in recent games there have been a, a few hairy moments I said sort of on a pod that we did the other day that this is no longer a fair fight because if it was Aaron Ramsdale would be given an opportunity back in the team and I know that the circumstances around uh, him not being in the side on Saturday were a little bit special a little bit different because obviously his wife had given birth and he'd taken some time away which is fair enough um, back in the squad last night travelled on the bench but didn't feature um, and I guess you know and I said, made this point earlier in the week Mikel Arteta almost had an excuse not to play him yesterday because he could always say well you know he didn't train for a day and he wasn't with us and you know he's been going through something life changing and very very different and all the rest of it and so Arteta had a little bit of a get out of jail free card with regards to the selection last night I felt but then it was on David Raya to show um, that that was the right decision and the right selection and to go some way in starting to justify why he has replaced Aaron Ramsdale and look we'll come on to talk about him in a minute but was I surprised that Ramsdale wasn't back in the team no is it what I would have done yes but it, I wasn't surprised um, to see the lineup when I did Tommy Asu came in at left back to replace Zinchenko and that was something that I absolutely would have done um, I think defensively Zinchenko has been a problem for us uh, of late and it started to show in the second half of last season and we'd get away with it most weeks because we'd be so dominant and he'd contribute so much to that by going into midfield. But the truth is he's not been anywhere near as effective in that midfield area this season. And therefore, if you factor that in with the fact that defensively he's not looking great, I think it was time to make that change. And Tommy Asu, I thought, was uh, was superb. And again, he's someone's performance. He's someone whose performance, I should say, uh, we're going to delve into in a little bit more detail uh, a little bit later on great to see the front three um, of Saka Jesus and Martinelli playing again you feel like it's going to take a little bit of time for them to click into gear again for them to find their rhythm uh, once again but that was the uh, the starting lineup so the game begins um, and I thought we looked quite good I thought we looked quite comfortable I think we did a good job of showing uh, the Sevilla faithful that we were here and we meant business and I think that did impact the atmosphere because when you compare what it was pre-kickoff to what it was in the first 10-15 minutes of the game it was totally totally different we created a really early chance for Gabriel Martinelli Gabriel Jesus did brilliantly to go and just hold the pass wait for Martinelli's run he knew Martinelli would be busting the gut to come up on the outside of them another example of the brilliant relationship that those two have um, and he played the ball in behind Martinelli took the touch on and you have to say the goalkeeper got out really, really quickly and closed Martinelli down. And perhaps you could argue that that chance maybe just came a little bit too early in the game for him. Wasn't able to score. Uh, it was saved by the goalkeeper. And you, you're kind of sitting there thinking, this is the Champions League, guys. You've got to be ruthless. But at that point, I didn't feel any concern, any stress. I felt like we were going to create more. Um, but then it started to dry up a little bit in terms of what we were able to create. We had the ball... Uh, for periods of time Sevilla had plenty of the ball as well I think overall at the end of the game they had uh, slightly more possession uh, than Arsenal did I'll bring up the statistics in front of me just to sort of confirm that but you know it felt like it was pretty even in that sense and uh, of course Sevilla uh, managed to create an opportunity towards the end of the first half where a shot was uh, fired wide of David Raya's left hand post just um Having a quick look at those statistics, bear with me one second. Yeah, Sevilla, 56% of the ball. 
Arsenal 44%. Uh, they had 11 attempts at goal, Arsenal managed 14. So pretty close game in a lot of ways, in a lot of the metrics. Um, but Arsenal took the chances when they needed to and I thought managed to control the game at the right times and at the right points to make sure that we left with, uh, with all three points. But then came Arsenal's opening goal and it was right on the stroke of half-time. And it's a great time to score because of what it does to the opposition. It deflates, you know, it... it it feels like a kick in the gut for them and you could really feel that the wind had been taken out of the uh, the sails of the crowd because, as I say, just a moment or two before that, Sevilla had created a really, really opportunity, a uh, really, really good opportunity, I should say, uh, that was dragged just wide. And, you know, you just felt like that started to give the crowd a bit more encouragement and all the rest of it. Um, but to get that goal at that time was key. And listen, that goal... You know, Gabriel Martinelli will get all the plaudits and rightly so for staying calm and composed and rounding the goalkeeper the way he did and tucking it away and all the rest of it. Um, it was his first Champions League goal on his Champions League debut. A massive, massive moment for the Brazilian and it won't be uh, the last, that's for sure, in this competition because he's a top, top player. But that goal was all Gabriel Jesus. It was the three Gabbies combining. Gabriel's clearance up into the air Jesus brought it down not only does he bring it down but he has the awareness of what's going on around him not just in terms of Martinelli's run but he has the awareness of the positioning of the defenders and he manages this wonderful wonderful turn before playing a perfectly weighted pass in for Martinelli to run onto and uh, when Martinelli gets onto it you know it, it doesn't even look like he's running at full pace obviously he is but from where I was watching, it kind of looked like it all happened in slow motion. And such was the composure that he showed to kind of, um, you know, to take it on round the goalkeeper and then slot it into uh, into the back of the net. Sent the Arsenal fans into raptures. And before you knew it, uh, the full the full time half time whistle had gone. And all of a sudden, um, you know, Arsenal were in a really, really great position. So, um, yeah. Brilliant uh, end to the first half, uh, brilliant end to the first period. And um, yeah, you know, you can't really ask for much more than that. You know, we didn't concede too much in terms of opportunities, in terms of chances. Just that one that I could really think of. Um, we created a couple ourselves, but we were clinical on one of those occasions. And that gave us the edge, that gave us the lead. Apologies about the gate crashes. I don't know why the lady was standing over my shoulder uh, looking at the laptop. If you're listening on audio, you're probably thinking, what? But basically, <laughs> this lady was just standing over my shoulder looking at my laptop screen. <laughs> Weird. Anyway, um, right, so uh, we got to half time and, uh, and things were feeling pretty good. We're going to take a short pause and then uh, we're going to look uh, at that second half and discuss some of those other points. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to part two of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast, coming to you uh, from the old city of Seville. Uh, reflecting on Arsenal's 2-1 win over the Spanish Giants. Um, and yeah, we've, uh, we've touched on the first half, uh, we've discussed the lineup, and we've got plenty more to come. So please uh, stay with us throughout the duration. Remember, if you're watching this on YouTube, leave us a like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you're new because at the time of recording this we are just 50 subscribers away from that 30k milestone that we've been trying to get to for such a long time if you're listening on audio as well please do the usual subscribe leave us a review it really really does help so anyway on to the second half um just eight minutes into it after a really lively start from arsenal because i thought in the first half we were a little bit at times a little bit slow um in terms of our overall tempo um, we didn't really move the ball with, with that much zip. There were times where you questioned whether we had enough purpose in our play in terms of progressing the ball forward early enough to try and create chances. But the second half started really, really well. You can only imagine that Mikel Arteta would have been relaying similar points to those that I've just made to the players. You know, more tempo, more zip, more purpose. All of that was required to make sure that we went on and, and killed this game off or at least uh, went on and won it. Um, we didn't kill it off in the end, not enough anyway, because it, it all got a little bit nervy, or a little bit nervier than it should have done, and a little bit nervier um, than I'd have liked. But you know, ultimately, we still we still got the points, which is what matters. But just eight minutes into that second half, and Gabriel Jesus comes out with a, a stunning goal. St 
stunning, stunning goal. When he received the ball where he did, you thought it was impossible for him to score from there. You thought it's only a cross, uh, it's only a crossing opportunity. That's the best you can hope for from Gabriel Jesus in this situation. But he manages to drift inside into a bit of space. Lovely drop of the shoulder as he does so well. Quick changes of direction, things that have uh, become synonymous with Gabriel Jesus. And then he opens up his right foot and just bends it into the top uh, right-hand corner. As I said earlier on, 14 goals and four assists in seven UEFA Champions League starts uh, for Gabriel Jesus. So people can question, you know, whether Arsenal need another number nine and if they need a more out-and-out -out goal scorer and all the rest of it. And people can say whatever they like about him. But in this competition, which is Europe's premier competition, Gabriel Jesus performs and Gabriel Jesus shines. So... Um, Put a little bit of respect on his name because yesterday you saw both sides of Gabriel Jesus. He's often labelled as more of a facilitator than a goal scorer, and I've said that in the past. And I think that sometimes his contribution is um, is overlooked because it doesn't always it, it can't always be quantified with goals and direct assists because of the way sort of he, he impacts the build up. But yesterday you saw the best of both worlds with Gabriel Jesus you saw him produce a wonderful finish when he got an opportunity um, he did miss one in the first half although it was kind of a half chance with the way the ball came at him but you know you saw both sides you saw him finishing excellently but you also saw him um, you know being that facilitator being that provider and he'd have had two assists had Gabriel Martinelli put away the chance uh, in the first half as well so lots to love about his performance we'll come on to that uh, in a little bit more detail a little bit later on but um, all of a sudden Arsenal are 2 nil up and you feel like they're cruising. Then, uh, frustratingly, we give away a goal. And that goal came five minutes after Arsenal's second, which was really, really annoying and really, really irritating because you know, you're in a position where you feel like you're now going to go on, kick on and hopefully kill a game. And instead, you end up, you know, within minutes, switching off from a set piece and allowing them back in. And it was Gadelia's header uh, from a corner now, he seemed to get in between Ben White and Gabriel Jesus. You feel like they'd done a little bit of research there. You feel like, you know, he looked at the Arsenal defence and thought, I don't want to go up against Saliba. I don't want to go up against Gabriel. Um, you know, I I'm going to attack the area in which it appears that Gabriel Jesus is partly responsible. And why wouldn't you do that as an attacking player? You'll want to try and expose the spaces that you can. And from then on, you know, you're thinking, shit, we could be in for a rough ride here. And, and Sevilla kind of huffed and puffed and they had a few moments and there was one effort that was tipped onto the crossbar by David Raya um, from Mariano, I think it was a substitute. And you thought, ooh. Um, obviously, the flag went up and, and, and I think not only was he offside, if I'm not mistaken, but he'd handled the ball as well in the build-up, which, um, in fact, I think it was given for the handball um, over anything else. But... Yeah, you know, you looked at that and, and although I turned around to my mate that I was at the game with and I said, look, although, you know, that won't, wouldn't have counted anyway, it's just that encouragement that they garner from something like that, isn't it? The, the crowd getting up on their feet and all the rest of it. But Arsenal, after that point, I thought, managed the game really, really well. And that's what you want to see. You want to see the experienced players uh, sort of take the game by the scruff of the neck, just take control, um, run down the clock wherever possible and all the rest of it. You need that on these big European nights. You need that sort of stability, that assurance. And you don't get that from young players that haven't been around the block. You get it from your your Jorginhos. You get it from your Gabriel Jesuses. David Raya, listen, he hasn't played at this level and people will often level that at him. But he's a 27, 28-year-old goalkeeper who's been around the block a little bit. And, and I think he did a good job at times of um, just taking this thing out of the game, you know, collecting crosses and then going down onto the ground allowing balls to run out of play when people were sort of chasing them just putting his body in the way and letting them run out for goal kicks which could help you run down the clock on 73 minutes Mikel Arteta took off uh, Martin Odegaard and I thought that was the right decision he hadn't had a good game again um, he was better in the second half than in the first certainly more involved but it was the right call and Kai Havertz had come on in that position 
um, at Chelsea and done a really, really good job, I thought. So it made sense to, to make that change. And obviously with Kai Havertz, as we've discussed in the past, gives you that opportunity and that ability to go that little bit more direct at times um, and hold the ball up when you need him to. Uh, Mikel Arteta then went on to bring on Leandro Trossard for Bukayo Saka and uh, Eddie Nketiah for Gabriel Jesus, um, who I think has got a bit of an injury problem, which we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit. So, uh, so stay tuned on that one. But yeah, in the end, we saw the game out. And as I say, it's the first away win in the UEFA Champions League for Arsenal in a long, long time. So um, let's cherish it. Let's enjoy it. Um, let's turn our attentions back to the Premier League game against Sheffield United coming up on Saturday. Need to get three points on the board there. Nothing less than that will do. Um, and uh, yeah, now it's about recovery and uh, shifting our attention, uh, of course, uh, towards that one. But, you know, that's my kind of rundown of, of how the game went, the timeline of events, etc., etc. But there were a few talking points um, that I just made note of that I wanted to discuss on this episode. So we're going to do that. Uh, in just a moment we're going to take a very very short pause once again remember uh, leave a like on the video if you haven't done so already subscribe to the channel if you're new if you're listening on audio then please do leave us a review and we'll be back in a moment welcome back to part three of the chronicles of aguna podcast a few talking points for you and then uh, we're going to share some player ratings my player ratings uh, following uh, the victory out here in seville last night so um talking points in my notes, I've got, it's not Raya's fault. <laughs> um, look, David Raya has been shaky, okay? There's no doubt about that. And if I was, if, I, if I'm being completely honest with you, that moment where he came out to punch uh, a cross right at the end and ended up punching it backwards over the top of himself and just over the top of his crossbar, my heart was in my mouth. And if that had ended up in the back of the net, Mikel Arteta would have had hell to pay from the Arsenal fans because it's clear that the general consensus is from most, not everybody, but from most, that he's not done enough yet to warrant um, the sort of displacing of Aaron Ramsdale and his inclusion week in, week out now. Um, in terms of distribution, there were a few uh, stray passes, uh, which is going to happen when you're asking a goalkeeper to play that way. When you're asking a goalkeeper to play 60, 70 yard balls sometimes with accuracy, you're going to have some misses. Like that's, You could ask Jorginho, you could ask Declan Rice, Thomas Partey to play those passes over and over again. And even they wouldn't be accurate in that 10 times out of 10, let alone asking a goalkeeper to do it. So I think we have to afford him a little bit of wiggle room there. I think there's a bit of harsh criticism with regards to some of those longer passes because people are just bemused by the fact that he's been given the number one spot and can't really understand or figure out why or how that's happened and therefore they're maybe nitpicking a little bit um, but generally the distribution isn't much better I would argue the other thing is is that there have been a few hairy moments um, in terms of crosses and all the rest of it and we talked off the back of the Chelsea game about his aggressive starting position uh, when it comes to crosses and that puts him in a position to be able to deal with certain things and, uh, and and deal with dangerous situations. And uh, we saw that with that late punch that I mentioned there, where his aggressive position means he can get out to the ball first. And I think there was a severe forward within close proximity, so he, he needed to get there. Um, but obviously the execution of the punch was, was horrible. And, um, and in, the, in the end, he was extremely fortunate that he got away with it, because you can't tell me that he, he knew what he was doing. And he was trying to punch it over the top of the crossbar. So. Yeah, um, when I say it's not Raya's fault, I'm not talking about the performance. What I'm talking about is the way that some of the fans are, are sort of treating him. I think it's really, really important that whilst this debate around the two goalkeepers rages on, as it will continue to do for a number of weeks, I anticipate, maybe even longer, maybe even beyond that, we can't be showing negativity in the ground, at least, towards David Raya. And maybe even online and all the rest of it, because David Raya will be well aware of what's been said about him. You know, it's the, the main media narrative at the moment. You know, I was on TalkSport this morning with Alan Brazil and Ali McCoyst. And the first question they asked me wasn't about the performance or the result or the significance of it or Gabriel Jesus or Gabriel Martinelli or Tommy Asu or Rice or anything like that. The first question they asked me was, uh, was about the goalkeeping situation. So everybody else is making this the epicenter of the discussion when it comes to Arsenal at the moment. Maybe we need to 
just step back from it. And I, I've been saying that for a few weeks and then I keep getting lured and sucked back into it. So, you know, I said it the other day. I said, you know, I've tried not to make a big deal of this, but, you know, is it a fair fight? I have to start asking that question, um, you know, and, uh, and yeah, so it is a concern for me. But at this moment in time, I think it's important that we don't let that spill over to the point where we're being critical of David Raya. I mean, at the end of the game last night, Aaron Ramsdale came over to the away end and just stood there for about 30 seconds sort of applauding us. And, you know, the reaction and the response he got was magnificent. David Raya got nothing. Uh, granted, David Raya came over with a group of other players, but there was zero um, sort of acknowledgement of David Raya's performance from the travelling support. You know, they'll argue that, yeah, they were applauding that group of players. And, yeah, that's probably right. But there was no specific acknowledgement of David Raya's performance. And that shows you the difference in popularity between the two. But also it shows you that not everybody's convinced by the Spaniard. So he's still got some work to do. But I don't want that negativity to spill over to the point where, you know, we're making David Raya's life more difficult. It's difficult enough trying to settle into this team, trying to adapt to the way that Mikel Arteta's wanting him to play he doesn't need us on his case and on his back as well so um yeah that's just my kind of message uh, on that we've got to be careful i think how we discuss this and how we put our feelings across on this on a more positive note takahiro tomiyasu i thought was superb defensively gave us everything we needed popped up at center forward on a couple of occasions just like he did uh, against manchester city but defensively he's just so efficient um so strong so powerful aerially so capable as well and when you see teams try and drop the ball over the top of our fullbacks, you know, when you've got White and Tommy Asu in those positions, it equips you well against that threat. We don't have that ability to deal with those situations as effectively when Zinchenko's in the side. Is Tommy Asu as effective when he goes into the middle of the park? I don't think so. But as I said earlier, I think Zinchenko's effectiveness in that has waned because it's become a little bit predictable. So, you know, at the very least, let's defend well. And I thought Tommy Asu uh, did that. Arguably one of his best performances in an Arsenal shirt, I would say. And it's so strange because he is a right-footed player. I know people say he's two-footed. You know, he's predominantly right-footed, Takahiro Tomiyasu. would be the first to admit that. But he looks so much more comfortable at left-back than at right-back. And I can't for the life of me work out why that is. But hey, um, it works. And, and he deserves to continue in the team uh, for me. Um, moving into midfield, Declan Rice, superb. Superb performance from him. He was everywhere and... At the end of the game, when things were getting a little bit desperate and we were a little bit tired and we really needed someone to grab a hold of the game, he was magnificent. Winning tackles, back covering at left back, back covering at right back at times, dropping in front of the back four, carrying the ball through uh, the lines when we needed him to, to just give us that bit of respite uh, in the second half. I thought it was another stellar performance from Declan Rice and he's just getting better and better. And, you know, I, I keep saying this, you know, maybe we should be giving West Ham a call and saying look maybe we owe you a little bit more because Declan Rice has proven to be worth every penny of the 100 million pounds that we we spent on him and in the absence of Thomas Partey to still have him shows you that the squad is much stronger and in a much better state and in a much better position listen I can't wait to see them play together I've said that repeatedly um, but he's just um, he's just been magnificent hasn't he um, on Gabriel Jesus we touched on how good his performance was the fact that he's been a facilitator but also uh, a, a direct contributor yesterday as well uh, which is great to see but of course the bad news is that he came off uh, with what looks like a hamstring injury Arteta confirmed that he felt the hamstring Jesus seemed to play it down when speaking to the media after he said he felt something did some tests with the physios doesn't think it's too bad um, we'll have a scan and an assessment over the next couple of days fingers crossed it isn't too bad but um, you know <laughs> It's, um, it's just our luck, isn't it? You know, Thomas Partey's on the treatment table again. He missed that altogether on this one because of a, a muscle problem, which you can only imagine is probably a reoccurrence of, of the problem that he's had. I, I don't know, I'm guessing they're speculating. I hope it's not. I hope it's just one of those where, you know, you're coming back from a long period out. You put a little bit of workload on um, to try and see, you know, what your boundaries are and you just cross that line just a little bit, which causes a slight tweak, which you can get over. Uh, pretty rapidly fingers crossed but yeah it's just been our luck this season you know we just get Martinelli and Saka back and now we're probably going to be without Jesus for a little bit so yeah frustrating um, it is frustrating but it is what it is and um, you know until we know the, the extent of that problem I don't want it to overshadow his excellent performance 
um, that he turned in, uh, of course, uh, last night. That leads me on to the final bit. Uh, let's do some player ratings. Um, let's start with David Raya in goal. I'm going to give him a six and a half. Um, I thought he did some things really well, others not so well. Distribution wasn't great. I think he gave the ball away about six times I counted and I haven't looked at the stats. That's just off the top of my head. Um, so he could have done better, could have done more. Um, that moment at the end was really, really nervy. Maybe it was a bit of luck that he deserved um, given the heat that he's getting at the moment. Not just from Arsenal circles, but from everyone with regards to his performances and also um, his uh, sort of replacement of, of Aaron Ramsdale and all the rest of it. Six and a half out of ten, I'll give David Raya. Uh, White, I'm going to give him a seven. I thought it was a solid fullback performance from him. Uh, Saliba, I'm going to give him an eight. Gabriel, I'm going to give him an eight. I think those two are just immense at the back. So solid, so comfortable. They can deal with pretty much anything. You know, you pin us back, they'll sit on the edge of their box and they'll clear balls to front. Um, you know, you sit off us and we push up on you and you drop balls over the top of us. Those who have got the pace, the now the awareness to, to be able to cover ground as well and, uh, and deal with those situations. Tommy Asu gets a 9 out of 10 for me. I thought that was arguably his best performance in an Arsenal shirt. And it's not even in what most people would consider his best position. Moving into midfield, I give Rice a 9 as well. I'm going to give Jorginho a 7.5. I thought he was under... Um, the radar good last night um, really good in possession dictated the game well very responsible with the ball can't remember him giving the ball away more than once um, which was a, a moment in the second half um, but I thought his experience really helped us in terms of just taking the sting out of the game at the right times and in the right moments um, so seven and a half for Jorginho um, wore the armband as well at the end of the game as well which was interesting um, Martin Odegaard four um, just totally ineffective in the first half a little bit more involved at least a little bit sharper in terms of his um, mobility and all the rest of it in the second period and the fact that he was getting on to a couple more loose balls but he didn't impact the game in any way shape or form so a 4 out of 10 for me Saka can have um, a 6 uh, again looks a little bit rusty not quite as effective as you'd like him to be gave us a bit of an outlet in the second half at times carried the ball up that right flank on a couple of occasions but 6 out of 10 Martinelli gets an 8 for me um, you know I thought that he took the goal really well but he did miss another really good chance and outside of that although he worked hard and carried the ball down that left hand side for us on numerous occasions I don't think he was quite at the races in terms of being at his absolute best so an 8 um, and then Jesus star man man of the match rightly so 9.5 out of 10 for me and the only reason he doesn't get a 10 is because he went off injured. <laughs> um, but I thought he was uh, magnificent, as I say, provider, but also direct contributor as well. Really, really great day um, at the office for him. So, um, yeah, really, really good performance. Really, really pleased. Thank you uh, for tuning in. Thank you for bearing with the fact that it's not live today, um, but the internet connection is not great. So I didn't want to risk starting it and then it being a mess. Plus, uh, we're an hour ahead here and I'm recording this at 9.30 uh, a.m. Spanish time which is 8.30 your time who the hell is going to tune in and watch me uh, talk about Arsenal at that time anyway thank you all so much remember like the video subscribe to the channel if you're brand spanking new uh, we'll be bringing you another episode tomorrow that will be focused solely around your questions so leave some in the comments for me and then of course um, we'll be bringing you the big match preview building up, up building up I should say to the weekend where we take on Sheffield United. So lots of content to come on the Chronicles of Aguna. Turn your notifications on. You know the drill by now. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, I'm going to go and enjoy Seville now uh, with a big smile on my face because Arsenal picked up three points on the road. Catch you all soon. Cheers.